this this is going to be kind of like a uh, like a uh, one of those movies where you like flash back chronologically. Nice. Because with our with the last episode, we talked about bankruptcy, which is kind of what happens when a person is so overloaded with debt that they need to access some kind of debt relief. And now we're going to talk about uh, credit, which is what debt is before it becomes debt, before it sours into uh, becoming debt. Mm. And um, the bill that we're going to be talking about is called the Loan Shark Prevention Act. Um, it's a bill introduced in the Senate by Senator Bernie Sanders and introduced in the House by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, the uh, bill has been uh, really pushed with a focus on uh, payday lending, uh, title loan lending, um, and uh, subprime credit card lending. Uh, the first two have been really big targets of the progressive world over the last two decades, I would say. Um, they uh, payday lenders and title loan uh, shops really sort of represent the uh, the worst of the worst when it comes to subprime lending. Um but, but what's uh, really radical about this bill is it uh, proposes to set a 15% uh, 15 uh, APR usury cap. And what that would do uh, would be to make a lot of uh, credit cards that currently exist have illegal interest rates. I'm sure that many of your listeners have credit cards that have APRs above 15%. I certainly do. Um, yep. And uh, uh, because of that, uh, the bill has generated uh, quite a bit of controversy, not just um, among the usual, um, the usual suspects, but even a lot of uh, liberals and progressives have been wary um, about signing on to this bill. And last I checked, I believe uh, none of the major consumer rights organizations have signed on to the bill as of yet. Huh. Um, when uh, I was last in D.C. lobbying uh, with the National Association of Consumer Advocates, um, and to be clear, this was before the Loan Shark Prevention Act was introduced. Um, we knew that it was coming, but it hadn't been introduced yet. And what we were telling lawmakers was we wanted an APR cap of 36 percent, which wow. is. Um, I'm no mathematician, certain... but that's more than double. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and uh, to be clear, uh, 36% would be really big because right now, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about why this is, uh, but most, uh, most credit cards and a lot of consumer lending in general is not subject to any caps on interest rates, hmm. either because uh, the state laws do not provide for it or because the institution doing the lending um, is through a nationally chartered bank, which makes it exempt um, from state usury caps. Sneaky bastards. Can, can you explain what APR is and how it works? Isn't yeah. it uh, yeah. annual, annual percentage, percentage rate? Annual percentage rate, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, as... Uh, as we all know um, from our credit cards and from uh, other things, other sorts of uh, consumer credit that we may have, um, when a financial institution lends uh, you money, lends you credit in some form, um, it uh, they're not doing it out of the kindness of their heart. They're doing it <laughs> to make some money. 
and uh, the way uh, that they make money outside of fees and some other things, um, the main way that they make money is through uh, the interest, um, a percent of the principal, which is what you were, what the credit that was extended to you, um, that gets compound, that gets compounded, usually monthly. Um, we're going to be talking about, or we might touch on um, with some things like payday loans, where um, that's not how those work. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, most people are familiar with interest being compounded uh, monthly, and the APR is expressed as a percentage that represents the actual yearly cost of funds over the term of a loan. And uh, yeah, so that's basically what APR is. It's just the, the interest rate on um, your loan. Um, and, yeah. and so- And I guess, uh, right, like the, the key yeah. thing, <clears throat> the key thing to, to, to think about in this context, I think, in the, in the context of, um, you know, consumer credit is that, uh, your, you know, your, your, your credit card, you know, will have, they'll, they'll give you your, your 22, 26, 36%, sometimes like 50%, I think, uh, APR, you know, depending on how good your credit is and so on. Um, mm -hmm. but then, you know, you know, you look at like a, a payday loan, as you were saying, and these are very short term and you'll have like, like we'll give you a loan secured by your your next paycheck, which is you know the the fee on it the 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 charge for the loan will be like twenty bucks on a on a, like a four hundred dollar paycheck. But then you do the math over the the you know you're you're loaning somebody money for like two weeks and the and the APR then will be like four hundred percent you know just massive interest interest charges. And so this you know as you I think that's kind of what you were referencing before, right? That um, a, a cut to 36%, a cap on, on all consumer credit of that level would be like transformative for those uh, type of businesses. They would have to to really cut the charges that they're, they're giving people, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, we know, we actually know what the effect uh, would be on businesses from uh, the states that have been coined uh, payday free landia by the Center for Responsible <laughs> Lending and other consumer advocacy groups. Um, and it's essentially, it abolishes payday loans. Um, you can't, you essentially can't provide as a for-profit institution um, loans with two week terms to this particular population of people and at such small amounts and make a profit without charging interest rates. Um, at least, I think, I think some of the lower payday lenders will charge interest rates at like 200%. Uh, percent. Um, very generous and, for them. Only 200%. Yeah, very generous. <laughs> and there are some, um, there are some finance, uh, what, uh, what I guess we would call more legitimate financial institutions, like some of the major banks um, have been toying at things that are kind of like payday loans, um, short term, uh, low amount. Um, and those usually range in the sort of, uh, you know, 50% APR to like 150% APR. Um, so even those uh, would be come would be abolished by an interest rate at uh, uh, thirty-six percent. Let alone uh, the fifteen percent that Bernie Sanders and AOC are pushing for. So, um, again, this is a pretty controversial. Um, this is a very controversial bill because of how extreme it was. And um, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Luke Heron at uh, Yale Law School. Uh, reach out to me and to a number of other uh, much more experienced and uh, well well written uh, colleagues um, to debate the subject. Um, unfortunately, 
uh, two of those folks, uh, Mercer Bardaran and uh, Professor Cray Johnson, uh, were not able to uh, participate in the end, but I highly recommend people um, check out their work. Uh, uh, Mercer Bardaran in particular has written some really amazing things on uh sort of uh, what she calls Jim Crow credit and the sort of relationship between racism and, and private credit. Uh, but anyways, uh, so uh, Luke uh, is, uh, I don't know what his official position, I think he's the editor maybe, or one of the co-editors of this great blog that I really cannot recommend enough for people interested in the law. It's called uh, Law and Political Economy. And uh, they host a number of uh, fascinating uh, debates. Um, uh, They do uh, what's called um, Boston Review style, Hmm. uh, uh, which basically has uh, one author start out, um, and the posts are limited to, uh, no less or no more than, uh, 1400 words, which is very difficult for someone as, uh, (laughs) wordy as I tend to be. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, other people respond to that post. Um, so, uh, the, uh, the person who started this out wasn't me. It was uh, Professor Ann Fleming, who uh, wrote uh, what's um, probably, I would I would say, is the go-to book. Um, funny enough, I've cited it a number of times advocating for this bill, even though she uh, opposes the bill. That'll show her. Um, <laughs> it's, I think it's called City of Debt. Um And so she wrote um, a post called, uh, it's titled, A Single Federal Usury Cap is Too Blunt an Instrument. And basically what her argument is, is, you know, look, no one knows more than me, you know, how bad uh, these sort of payday loans and other predatory lenders are. I literally wrote the book on it. She says, but if you look at the history um, of payday lending in this country, and payday lending has been around for quite some time. Oh, yeah, her her book is uh, City of Debtors, A Century of Fringe Finance. Um, She says, when you look at the history, a lot of places that had um, strict usury laws, had strict uh, interest rate caps um, later rolled those back, and particularly these rollbacks were pushed for by uh, progressives. And the reason why was you had a sort of prohibition type effect where the uh, outlawing of these loans uh, allegedly created a black market that was not regulated, you know, in any way. And that these, you know, these are the sort of infamous loan sharks, you know, who wouldn't just charge high interest rates, but would, you know, break your kneecaps if you didn't uh, pay up on time. Um, So uh, that's, uh, that is essentially her argument is, You know, if we if we do this again, we're just going to bring back a black market for these loans um, and that there are other ways um, to stop the abuses of payday lenders, such as by getting uh, encouraging more legitimate financial institutions to make these kind of loans like uh, federally chartered banks um, and uh and so on um she does not it's worth noting that she does not think that uh postal banking uh would be able to fill the demand um for these kind of loans 
So what was what was your response to the Tony Soprano objection? <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I I really wanted to be clear from the outset. So my first my first argument was we should absolutely abolish payday lending. You know, the point of instituting this interest cap, I, I don't want to beat around the bush about it. Payday lending should not exist. We should make it illegal, period. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, while uh, I don't deny the history that she's talking about, I would, you know, add in a couple of caveats, which is, you know, first off that um, these uh, progressives were for the most part um, pushing for a higher interest cap rather than the elimination of an interest cap at all. And uh, the problem that we currently have in the United States is that federally chartered banks are not bound by any state usury laws, and there's no federal usury law. That's because of this case called uh, Marquette National Bank of Minneapolis, the first of Omaha Service Corporation. Um, it was a unanimous decision, um, as some of my least favorite cases are. <laughs> and um, it uh, essentially... Uh, made a sort of a federalism type argument. Um, in the United States, we have something called uh, federal supremacy. And that means federal law trumps state law. And so the idea is that the state usury laws could not apply to loans that basically had a stamp of approval from the federal government. Uh, and uh, because of this, we're in a much worse situation, actually, in terms of uh, usury caps than those progressives were in or that they would even, you know, dream of advocating for. It's a, a completely different situation. Um, and, you know, the second thing is. Uh, you know, I, I can't speak to whether or not uh, prohibiting um, high interest lending in the 19th century did more harm than it did good. Uh, <laughs> Professor Fleming, you know, is is literally the expert on that. But I can tell you uh, what it does now um, in New York, for example, we have a interest rate cap at 25%, um, which has effectively prohibited uh, payday lending in uh, New York. And uh, this great group called the Center for Responsible Lending did a study where they estimated that uh, the states that have prohibited payday lending have saved working class people who live there $5 billion per year just because of uh, the fees that come along with payday lending and auto title lending. Um, and just a very quick explanation on auto title lending um, for those not familiar with it, um, it's a very insidious uh, kind of uh, high interest lending uh, where you essentially bet against your car <laughs> and uh, you take it, you, you uh, essentially uh, allow a, the high interest lender to be able to take your car if you don't pay up. And what both payday lending and auto title lending tends to do is put people in what we uh, refer to as the debt trap, um, where when the person is not able to make their payments on the loan, um, they're not able to pay up after the two weeks, which is usually the length um, that these loans are supposed to last. 
uh, the payday lender or the auto title lender will say, no worries, just take out another loan. Mm -hmm. Just take out another loan on top of that loan to pay off that loan. Um, And so uh, a lot of conservative advocates will argue, um, oh, you can't say that the APR for payday lending is over 400 percent because, you know, they're not they don't even last a year. So there's no, there, it doesn't make sense to do an annual percentage rate. But that ignores the fact that a lot of people who get stuck into these debt traps uh, wind up uh, going through so many of these loans over such a long period of time um, that it, uh, you know, we're talking about effectively months of interest and sometimes even uh over a year yeah yeah and 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 this uh you know maybe seems like it's 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 worth considering i think you sort of gesture at this in the article but but the uh the kind of flip side of the the equation which is kind of background inequality right so like um you know, I just recently checked a mortgage rate on a thirty-year loan, uh, three, three and three eighths, three and a half percent. So it's like bouncing around in there, um, and that you know that's considerably less than uh, a, a a a a payday loan. And the reason, mm-hmm. presumably, is that you know for people who are taking out a mortgage, they have like decent wages uh, and and like a decent income flow to support that, you know, to support a, a, a fairly marginal uh, uh, lending product in which like m- almost every person is going to repay in full. Um, and, you know, it's like you, you, you sort of see the business logic of why payday, payday loans and, and auto title loans and so on are, are so usurious. I mean, number one, because they're, they're run by these incredibly predatory, awful people. But number two, because, the, you know, you're you're giving to such a such a desperate population that just as a sort of mechanical necessity, lots of them aren't going to be able to afford it. They're not going to be able to uh, make the payments just through some sort of, you know, difficult difficulty that they run into. They don't they don't have the cash. And, um, you know, so if you were to make the system more equal, the, the whole broader income distribution uh, more equal that that um, you know everybody who worked had a decent you know a sort of like like minimum minimum like decent standard of living and so on. Uh, then this sort of it's like on the one thing on the one hand this these sort of lending products would be less attractive and on and uh, and on the other hand they would be less necessary because people wouldn't be. In these situations where it's like, oh, you know, my car broke down and like I just I got to do whatever I can to get the money, you know, and then you get sucked into this like debt whirlpool type of thing. Right. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's sort of two two things I want to build off uh, what you said. The the interesting thing about mortgages is uh You know, the terms are more favorable, and part of it is the reasons that that you said about that generally the sort of people who are buying a home are more financially stable, they have better incomes, they're less likely to default, um, uh, and it's also over a a much longer period of time, Um, they're much easier to uh, negotiate, um, you're able to refinance them if needed because you have a, uh, you, you have collateral to, uh, finance against if you need to. Um, but, uh, the, the one, uh, caveat I would put there, and I think the one, you know, the one thing I always love to bring up with, uh, conservatives who argue with me about this is the 30 year mortgage that we all know and love is not a, is not a product of the quote unquote free market. Yes. It wouldn't exist without government intervention. Uh, you even had Steve Mnuchin, 
the current Treasury Secretary and one of the biggest proponents of privatizing uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, he recently admitted in congressional testimony that a 30-year mortgage would not be possible if it weren't for government intervention. And uh, I think that's really a sort of a key thing uh, to point out here um, that, you know, with poor people, uh, it's, well, let's just let the market do what it will unto them. But then when it comes to wealthier people, all of a sudden, in that case, the government should intervene and make it possible to have these uh, favorable terms. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. And, and um, in, fa- in fact, I re- re- uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think bef- this is a new deal like creation, a 30 year mortgage. It doesn't exist in a lot of countries and it didn't exist before the new deal. Right. Like before. 1930s, when you bought a house, you had a five-year loan generally, and then it was just a balloon payment with the entire principal due at the end of the loan, right? And then if you couldn't refinance, you were fucked, which which is what happened as a major engine of the uh, the Great Depression, because you had you know millions and millions of people who had been refinancing, you know, on five-year increments, and then it was like the whole economy melted down, and suddenly they couldn't get credit, and it was just like you know, boom. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, And uh, if I recall correctly, um, pre um, uh, pre the Great Depression and the New Deal, um, a lot of the financing um, for homes came from savings and loans institutions that really uh, didn't calibrate well. Um, and so a lot of the institutions that supported the mortgages would go under um, when these people weren't able to afford their payments at the end of the five year term. And so that's where you get the sort of domino effect um, that that really causes uh, economic systemic risk. Um, and of course, we saw this again with the foreclosure crisis. Um, a lot of your listeners may be familiar with the term balloon payment from the kind of subprime mortgages um, and the, you know, uh, the various different kinds of scammy subprime mortgages that were out there. Balloon payments were a um, a favorite tool of subprime mortgage lenders, as well as the infamous ninja loans um ninja standing for no income no job <laughs> um so and which, no assets right which is disappointing no assets, because yeah. it sounds way cooler when it's just the acronym <laughs> yeah it sounds awesome like who doesn't <laughs> who wouldn't want, want a ninja loan ninja. Come on. 